I thought uh, vaccine development was a long and arduous process, but I had my uh, pocket picked uh, on Saturday night, and I have spent today running around Addis collecting various signatures so that I can get back into the UK, and that makes vaccine development seem comparatively straightforward. So, uh, but uh, my, my uh, host at the Ministry of Health, we were here last week for a board meeting of SEPI, and I'll, I'll talk about that uh, just momentarily, but my, my host at the Ministry of Health uh, helped me through that process. So I want to first thank them because it would have been impossible as, a, as somebody trying to find my way uh, through a complicated process. So I apologize for running in literally 10 minutes before my talk. That my intent was to be here all day, but uh, I, I had this unexpected development. So I'm going to start, actually, um, with a, a rather remote example to, to talk about uh, the impact of pandemic and epidemic diseases. Um, this is the Valley of Thebes at Luxor, uh, the uh, necropolis of uh, Minhotep. It was actually started, uh, they started burying Egyptian royalty uh, here at Luxor in the 11th dynasty, and I don't even know exactly how long ago it was, but it was a long, long time ago. Um, this, uh, the, the large temple in the background is the uh, burial chamber of, of Hatshepsut, which is probably one of the most famous uh, of Egyptian antiquities, and is, you know, is, has been known and studied uh, uh, and had been a site of pilgrimage and, and uh, tourists for you know, hundreds of years at least. Um, but what's remarkable is that they are still making discoveries here. And in the foreground, you can see the, the small ruins of the buildings. Um, I'll give you a close-up. If you can see the caves at the bottom of that picture, um, this is the cenotaph of Harwa, who was a, a viceroy of Upper Egypt in the 26th dynasty. So people were buried here continually from the 11th dynasty to the 26th dynasty. Harwa uh, started the, the new tombs, which you can see at the bottom, uh, about 700 BC, and people were buried there for almost a thousand years. Uh, that tomb was not discovered until 1995, and the Italian archeology span expedition in Luxor has been excavating that tomb for about 20 years. And as they have dug it out, they, they have found something extraordinarily interesting. And in the highest layers of sediment, I, I don't know if the legend, if you can read it, uh, which stop abruptly in the mid third century uh, AD, uh, they found evidence of a massive uh, corpse processing uh, operation that was set up apparently fairly abruptly. And they, they, were, uh, they had lime kilns, they were, they were uh, generating lime uh, to, to place onto large numbers of corpses, and they, and they found um, evidence of that, uh, skulls. And, and, uh, and, and so what you can see is in the, the green area uh, was the area of the mausoleum that was given over to the production of lime. The number two at the bottom in the center was an area for bonfires, presumably for the burning of large numbers of corpses. And uh, what, what that actually was, was, was among the first evidence and uh, physical evidence that we have of a, of a well-known plague, uh, the plague of Cyprian, which actually emerged from Ethiopia, according to tradition. I mean, obviously, there's, there's very little records, but Luxor was one of the first sites in the Roman Empire that was affected. And, and pandemics began to affect the Roman Empire in the second century AD, largely for reasons that we think emerging diseases are beginning to be more frequent and prevalent now. It, it related to the trade and transportation networks that were set up within the Roman Empire facilitating mobility of people, as well as relatively abrupt climate change that began to occur in the second century. The plague of Cyprian occurred in the mid third century. Uh, the, the first plague, the plague of the Antonine Plague of around 150 AD uh, is, is very well attested because Galen, the greatest of Roman physicians, actually treated hundreds of people during that plague and left comparatively detailed clinical accounts of, of the illness. And from his accounts, it is 
Um, modern scholars have, have, with some degree of certainty, deduced that the plague of, of uh, the Antonine plague was due to smallpox. But the plague of Cyprian uh, has been more mysterious. The, the only real clinical account that we have was provided by St. Cyprian, who was a bishop of Carthage. And uh, his, his description to modern eyes, particularly to eyes that have recently experienced large phylovirus and hemorrhagic fever outbreaks, it sounds uh, remarkably like a hemorrhagic fever. He talks about high fevers, diarrhea, bleeding, um, bleeding into the eyes, bleeding out of the mouth, um, a, a disease that moves very quickly uh, and is transmitted person to person, or we're deducing that from his account, obviously. He didn't have a, a germ theory of disease. But the plague, whatever it was, whether it was a viral hemorrhagic fever, whether it was pandemic influenza, whether it was smallpox or a disease that we don't know, did appear to emerge from Ethiopia. It spread to Alexandria by the year 249, to Rome by the year 251, and it affected the entirety of the Roman Empire. It was said that at the peak, 5,000 people a day were dying in Rome. At least two emperors uh, died from the plague. And it precipitated a, a, a crisis in the Roman Empire. Um, coinage of silver stopped for several years during the Antonine Plague, precipitating a fiscal crisis. The army couldn't be paid. The borders began to buckle. And as, as Rome emerged from the plague, two things happened. One, the Roman emperors became, for all intents and purposes, for the rest of the Roman Empire, they came from the military, which had not been the case previously. And second, and this is very interesting, Christianity, which had been a uh, marginal sect until the beginning of the third century, maybe as many as 100,000 adherents across the Roman Empire, um, exploded in popularity. And, and, and some historians of the church now think that that was a function of the Christian ethic of sacrifice and taking care of plague victims, and the fact that supportive care probably improved outcomes for plague victims. And so um, at the end of the third century, of course, Christianity had become the dominant religion in the Roman Empire. Constantine shortly in the beginning of the fourth century converted to Christianity, and, and the rest is history, as, as, as we say. But it demonstrates, one, the speed with which Plagues and pandemics can spread globally, even, even in, a, in late antiquity. It speaks to the impact that they can have on entire civilizations, uh, the economic impact, the human impact. And it is, is just one of a litany of plagues that we're familiar with uh, from the historical record. Updating that to the 21st century, um, certainly the plague of Cyprian is gone and hopefully for good. Um, but we, we still have plagues. This is the slide that I made last year to make the point that epidemic disease is still important, still has tremendous economic impact. I think you're all aware of the outbreak of plague in Madagascar. It came early. It was larger than, than other annual epidemics have been. Uh, ultimately affected thousands of people, led to closures of, of schools, implementation of, of pretty severe non-pharmaceutical interventions in uh, Madagascar placed a number of countries that were connected with Madagascar by trade or tourism routes on alert uh, and was, was finally uh, brought under control after, after raging out of control for several months. Um, I've been using this slide, but I think I, I need to update it. As, as all of you know, we're in the midst of, of a significant Lhasa outbreak. This is the second especially large, especially early Lhasa outbreak, uh, annual outbreak in a row. Uh, Nigeria CDC and WHO are leading the response. Obviously, right now, the, the principal focus is on gaining control of the outbreak. But WHO, through its global coordination mechanism, is also uh, beginning to think about what can be accomplished from a research perspective uh, during a Lhasa epidemic. Lhasa is one of CEPI's, uh, the principal diseases that we focus on. And we have been talking with WHO, through them to Nigeria CDC, um, you know, discussing, we don't imagine that a vaccine is part of the immediate response for this year's epidemic, and, and we don't want to disrupt the emergency response trying to move a, pre a vaccine in prematurely, but there is a great deal of work that would be relevant to the response that could greatly inform vaccine development efforts that we'll be supporting uh, really starting, you know, now uh, and in subsequent years, and to the extent that those 
um, kinds of studies can be incorporated, integrated into the overall response and help inform the response. Um, you know, we, we uh, are certainly willing, uh, you know, to work with our colleagues in, in Nigeria CDC, but the, the principal important thing, obviously, is getting the epidemic under control. But there's been, over the last decade and more, you know, just a, a continuous drumbeat of emerging diseases, starting with Nipah in the 90s, SARS in the early 2000s, H5N1 around 2004, 2005, the pandemic in 2009, MERS, Ebola, Zika, um, the, the, the list just rolls on and on. And I think CEPI's argument um, to the world is, is that, you know, the world, you know, this is a global problem. It needs a global solution and uh, it, it's time for the world to organize itself. The impact even of these smaller epidemics can be tremendous. The Ebola epidemic last year, or in, or in sorry, in 2014, 2015, uh, in three small countries in West Africa, in countries that you know, were you know, impoverished countries still caused $3 billion worth of damage to their economy and probably resulted in the expenditure of two or three times that by the global community in terms of bringing um, the outbreak under control. Had a huge impact, as you can see in the lower center slide on, the, on GDP in Sierra Leone. Um, other epidemics, SARS, uh, you know, 8,000 cases affecting more than 20 countries with an estimated economic impact of between 45 and $50 billion. Um, Zika's uh, economic impact is still to be calculated based on the number of, of infants that were affected with the neurological uh, defects. Um, in retrospect, you know, it's, it's always easy to say, um, gosh, it would have been nice if we had had a vaccine. Vaccines take major investment. They, they require a long time to develop currently. That's one of CEPI's goals is to, is to change those timelines. But, um, you know, we think that there are threats um, that we can anticipate that we can be developing vaccines for, and we think there are capabilities that we need to be able to respond to new threats like Zika if they emerge suddenly and, and surprise us. I think um, it's, 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 it's really remarkable Given all the advances in, in biology, biotechnology, communications, uh, and, and our ability to detect these diseases fairly early, um, not that we don't have a long way to go on surveillance, and, and certainly I appreciated what I, what I heard of your talk on diagnostics and would, would love to continue that discussion because diagnostics are, are obviously closely intertwined with any response. But it's amazing how little progress we've made in addressing epidemics through vaccines Perspectively, uh, certainly for emerging diseases. We, this is uh, the epidemic curve in, in Guinea. And uh, there's some important dates that I've highlighted up here, including a, a WHO high level meeting at which it was in consultation on, the, on Ebola vaccines, many of which had been extensively developed over more than a decade, particularly by the U.S. government by the U.S. military because of concerns about Ebola as a potential terrorist threat. So the vaccines were in late stages of preclinical development and the decision was made at the WHO consultation to, to move the vaccines into clinical development as rapidly as, as, as possible. And um, then a series of, of meetings were held uh, to explore what kind of clinical trial design should be used to develop that protocol, to secure financing, to set up um, investigation sites, um, and all of that work after the decision to move the vaccines into development, all of that preparatory work for you know, securing funding, setting up sites, training uh, clinical investigators on the ground in, in terms of how the protocol, the protocol design, took five months. And so the first patient wasn't actually vaccinated until way out in March, and you can see that the epidemic had been brought under control by normal public health interventions and education of the public and behavioral change. Um, but even though the vaccine trial started so late and had so little impact on the actual outcome of the epidemic, um, it was still started in time to generate data showing efficacy of the vaccine. I'd like to argue that, that those vaccines could have been moved into um, investigational trials much earlier, perhaps as much as five months earlier, if the world had, had engaged in all of that preparatory work, had thought about the clinical trial designs, had taken things to regulatory authorities and countries at risk, had looked at the ethics of the clinical trials. That's one of the 
activities that CEPI can undertake right now that can shave time on bringing vaccines into epidemic responses. The other, obviously, is funding those vaccines and accelerating their development to the point that they're ready to deploy much, much earlier. And so it was in the wake of the Ebola epidemic and, the, and really the, the global shame and regret that it had occurred, that it had been allowed to spin out of control, and, and that the world was so slow in responding, that a series of conversations began in 2015 about how um, the world could be better prepared for responses in the future. And over the course of about a year and a half, they led uh, a, a group of, of global public health leaders like Jeremy Farrar, like Victor Zhao, the president of the National Academy of Medicine, like Seth Berkeley uh, from Gavi and, and others, to devise, to come up with the idea of creating essentially a coalition uh, that, that would focus on developing vaccines, focus on having those vaccines ready for testing, and focus on securing the, the very substantial resources uh, required to, to, to do that. And so CEPI was launched at Davos formally uh, last year, so last January. We're just a little bit over a year old. And um, it, I was brought in as CEO in April of 2017, and we've been working hard to get the program up and off the ground. And I, I just want to give you a little bit of an update about where we are presently. Um, I do think it's important to underscore the, the coalition. That, that wasn't, um, you know, just for the sake of the acronym that, that we're called a coalition. We do bring together a broad set of stakeholders who, um, you know, have responsibilities and are, and are accountable to populations and to people, um, you know, across the whole spectrum of vaccine development. So we have had great partnership from uh, large pharmaceutical firms, the vaccine manufacturers, global vaccine manufacturers. Uh, we've had great partnership from a number of sovereign nations, uh, Norway, Germany, Japan, India, Canada, Australia, Belgium. Um, and I'm very pleased to say, uh, and this was announced at the CEPI board meeting on Thursday, that Ethiopia has decided to join CEPI as, as the first African member of the coalition. Uh, our focus is on emerging infectious diseases and focus on vaccines in, in specific, uh, and we're working very closely with WHO under the R&D blueprint to focus on priority um, diseases. We have four strategic objectives. Um, the first relates to preparedness for diseases that we can anticipate. Um, I'll talk about the three diseases that we've chosen to focus on in a moment. The second is on developing capabilities that allow us to respond rapidly to novel threats. I'll talk about that in a minute. The third is on establishing the basis of a partnership with our private sector uh, partners that, that makes sense for them. Uh, they, they undertake pretty extreme opportunity costs to work on vaccines that really have no commercial potential. And they, they want to do that. They feel the need to do that. It's actually in their interest to do that because if they don't do it now, <coughs> they'll be called upon to do it in the midst of an epidemic as they were during the Ebola <coughs> outbreak. Um, but um, it has to be something that they can defend to their stakeholders, to their shareholders and, and uh, boards. And um, so, so balancing the economics of, of, of this development proposition <coughs> is, is, is critically important. And the last, but, but not least, and uh, probably most important, to be honest, um, is our commitment to equity of access to these products. Uh, it is a fact that emerging infectious diseases almost universally impact the most vulnerable populations in the world. Part of that uh, derives from the fact that these populations um, live in countries where public health systems tend to be weak, where surveillance systems uh, are not strong, where diseases can emerge and spread uh, before they are even identified as novel threats. And if we cannot take these vaccines to the people who need them when they need them without barriers of price or other barriers to access, uh, then we will have failed in our mission. Technical success alone is not success. It's, it's, uh, we need to develop the vaccines and we need to ensure that the people who need them can have access to them when they need them. So in our, in our, as we undertake this mission, 
we have two roles. We, we have been entrusted with you know, a substantial amount of funds from our investors, um, almost 630 million US dollars at this point. Um, and we have a funding mission, and that's funding a particular piece of the vaccine development life cycle from, from the late preclinical stage through, fa through phase two clinical trials at present. Certainly in, in CEPI's first five years, our goals are to bring vaccines through phase two clinical trials and then to create what we're calling investigational stockpiles um, in regions at risk so that if epidemics of the diseases that we're focusing on actually occur, we can move these vaccines into clinical efficacy trials uh, with great speed. Uh, the other role that we have, um, and, and, and here we're learning lessons from the U.S. programs, which have been focusing on developing similar products, although not for emerging infectious diseases for almost 20 years at this point, is the importance of coordinating the stakeholders across that entire vaccine development life cycle. If, if CEPI were to sit in its little funding silo and only focus on its own technical success, I can assure you that these products would fail, that they would not be the products that the people in the field need, that they could not be delivered in time. So it's only in terms of working both with partners upstream from CEPI and downstream from CEPI to create an environment in which success is possible that we're going to be able to uh, have vaccines to, uh, to address these threats. So the target diseases, the, the three diseases that we have, have started uh, by targeting are MERS, Lhasa, and Nipah. Nipah, uh, probably the least well-known of these, is a, is a disease that causes a pneumonia and encephalitis and, and currently is principally found in Bangladesh but is a disease of South Asia uh, in the Pacific Basin. Um, we chose these three diseases. These are three of the ten diseases on the WHO R&D blueprint priority list and, and we selected these three from among the ten because of their potential public health impact and also because there was some evidence either based on what we understand about the immune response to the actual pathogens and the, the state of the vaccine pipeline. We thought there was a reasonable prospect of, of developing vaccines against these targets relatively quickly. And so the first call for proposals uh, was actually issued the day after the meeting at Davos and um, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a little status report momentarily, but just to show you the, the areas of exposure for the three diseases, uh, MERS, most of the MERS cases have originated in the Arabian Peninsula, particularly Saudi Arabia, but the disease is one of the risk factors for diseases is exposure to infected camels, and it's known that camels in the Horn of Africa, uh, here in Ethiopia included, um, you know, have uh, exposure rates, you know, 80, 90 percent and above, and so there is certainly risk for disease here in the Horn of Africa, um, you know, great risk in Saudi Arabia. And, and of course, there was a, a, a large outbreak in South Korea in 2015. A single case that was infected in the Arabian Peninsula traveled back to South Korea before becoming ill and then infected uh, you know, a number of people. The outbreak there ultimately resulted in 186 cases, 36 deaths, 24 hospitals were impacted, more than 2,000 schools were closed and about $10 billion of damage was done to the South Korean economy from a single case, introduction of a single case that was not picked up quickly. Um, and, and that's just illustrative of the fact that these are global problems. These are not regional problems. Lhasa, uh, a disease of, of West Africa principally from Sierra Leone to Nigeria, um, it's, it's thought to have a relatively high annual incidence of about uh, 300,000 cases a year, but uh, occasionally, large outbreaks occur, such as the outbreak uh, in Nigeria right now, and it does have a relatively high case fatality rate among patients who are ill enough to be hospitalized. And then Nipah, uh, which is a, 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 the reservoir species uh, are bats, uh, fruit bats. Uh, it has been transmitted into humans through the intermediary of pigs or directly uh, from bats in Bangladesh. Um, it's closely related to a virus, Hindra that uh, has caused outbreaks among horses and people in Australia. And, and you can see the range of the host species uh, there, although the, all the cases have been found so far in India, Bangladesh, Malaysia, and, and Australia. Oops. You want to brag a little bit? We, uh, 
signed our first partnership agreement with a, a small biotech firm, Themis, from uh, Vienna, Austria, uh, last Monday, one week ago today. Uh, and this is a partnership, uh, could be up to $37.5 million of investment from CEPI to support the development of a LASA vaccine and a MERS vaccine. And uh, the, the product development plan for the LASA vaccine, it could be entering phase one clinical trials as soon as the end of this year. And so we do think it's important um, to do what we can uh, during the current outbreak to secure necessary information about strain specificity, the epidemiology of disease, uh, make sure that we have a good case report uh, form that can inform clinical trials. Our second call for proposals, which we issued over the summer, was a call to develop um, rapid vaccine uh, development and manufacturing platforms. And um, we want to demonstrate that these platforms have activity across a wide range of viruses. And so we've asked uh, our partners to demonstrate uh, proof of concept against at least uh, three different viruses from different families. Um, we um, also have established a set of criteria for the dimensions of speed, and there are multiple dimensions in which speed is important. Speed in terms of developing a new vaccine from identifying a, a, a new pathogen, a new antigen against which a vaccine needs to be developed. Speed in terms of, of delivering immunity to those who are vaccinated. And speed in terms of ability to scale up manufacturing to large scale uh, so that we can respond to outbreaks if they spin out of control. The last thing I want to talk about um, is, is one of the um, components of CEPI um, that, that we've set up um, principally to support the development of our portfolio. This is our Joint Coordination Group, or JCG. And it's th this, this uh, forum within CEPI is a forum for institutional coordination. There are partners who are going to be involved in almost any conceivable vaccine that would be developed. Those are regulators, those are organizations like Gavi and UNICEF that would either fund or be responsible for stockpiling. Uh, organizations like NIBSC, which would be developing international standards, um, and WHO, MSF, the International Federation of the Red Cross, organizations that are responsible for coordinating, orchestrating a response, and, and responsible actually for orchestrating, in WHO's case, orchestrating coordination more broadly. And so these are partners that have longstanding institutional equities um, in all of the vaccines that we're going to be developing. And we also want to use this forum as a, as, a, as a place in which we can invite in public health officials, scientists, clinical trialists from regions at risk, because they also have an interest in you know, certain of the vaccines that we're developing. The countries of West Africa, for example, have a very strong interest in our efforts to develop uh, a Lhasa vaccine. The countries of the Arabian Peninsula, Ethiopia, Somalia, have a strong interest, particularly in our MERS portfolio. And for us to shave that five months off that I showed you, we had to wait before we could start the Ebola vaccine trial, we have to engage with those partners very early on in the vaccine development effort. And we have to bring them in. We have to uh, work with them to be prepared, create a sense of shared ownership in these products. And we're going to do that principally at an institutional level through our joint coordination group. We, we will do it in, in, in many, many different ways for the individual projects, um, you know, in, on individual scientific aspects. And, and we certainly are looking for partners, um, you know, from regions at risk to um, help us in our efforts. And so I think just in, in conclusion, I want to acknowledge, I'll start with this, the bullet at the bottom, actually. And, and I want to talk about some of the very serious challenges that we have faced in trying to develop vaccines against emerging diseases. It has been hard, and there have been setbacks recently. And we cannot let those setbacks um, discourage us. Uh, they're, they're certainly, uh, I think, uh, you know, the concerns about the dinghy vaccine have been highlighted uh, after it was licensed and, and began to be used, and, and certain populations being at elevated risk after receiving the vaccine. There are, um, you know, the Zika vaccine funding um, led, lack of funding led, led Sanofi to close its Zika vaccine program down. And we're still waiting for an Ebola vaccine to be licensed. These are real problems. These are 
challenges that we need to collectively address. These are challenges, part of the reason that CEPI was set up. And CEPI as an organization is committed to changing the way these vaccines are developed, changing the value equation for our private sector partners, changing the way partnerships are formed around these products. Uh, we've initiated our vaccine development portfolio. We'll be making more announcements about partnerships in coming months, and we are certainly looking uh, to expand our coalition. And as I said, we're just delighted that Ethiopia will be the first African nation in CEPI. So thank you.